first of all, we're going to touch on the process of design. And, you know, there's a lot to that one uh, comment. And we're going to touch on uh, various aspects. But we're also going to then address some of the central questions that often come up when you're a consultant or whether you're uh, engaging with a client um, that is at some various level embraced what's going on in the industry at large, or it's a hostile environment. I've been through all of that. Uh, so we can, uh, I wanted to touch on those things as well. So the two things there, of course, uh, which came up in initial questioning was uh, agile. What do you do with method in the agile, or method in agile? And then what do you do with method in DDD? So we're gonna touch on both of those. But we want to level set first on the value of uh, design, uh, which is actually, as strangely as it sounds, a critical concern in the industry right now. Um, and I don't, you know, I'd like to hear your anecdotal experience around that as well uh, from interacting with other clients or in your own development and, uh, environments. So just a little bit about me. Um, as many of you know, I'm an iDesign master architect. I've been doing this for quite a while. I was a former chief architect. I ran a dev shop of uh, almost 100 devs. Um, and that's when I came to the method. That was my seminal experience with the method as well. And there was a pivotal moment where I emailed uh, leadership saying that Monty is neither scalable no, nor sustainable. Uh, because as many of you know, and you're going to see, uh, you've seen in the AMC, if you've taken the AMC, the Iron Mike syndrome, uh, doesn't work out very well. So I actually built an architect practice to shield myself from burnout and took all of them to the AMC. And that was the launching point of my career, my real career, as it, as it turns out. Um, and just as a weird side note, um, I asked what turned out to be a very uh, meaningful question in the context of the AMC. I had the courage to actually raise my hand. And I received uh, a signed copy of the latest edition of uh, Programming WCF Services by Yuval, which I still have in my, on my uh, shelf. And then it, ironically, just by chance, over time, I ended up you know, co-authoring uh, a significant portion of it. So it can happen. If it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. So there's nothing very special about me at all other than I have a thick head and I refuse to give up. Um, so I'm also a drummer, and that's basically how I approached music because certain things with drumming, once I got into like independent limb management and polyrhythmic multi-time signatures, I didn't get in the beginning. And I just willed myself to figure it out. So you guys have seen that. Those of you who have taken the AMC, you've seen the, th the suck threshold, you've, you've seen all that stuff. So it's all there for you if you really want to go at it. Uh, the other thing that's very relevant about this is that, again, one of the reasons why I joined iDesign is because they actually practice architecture the way that the only way that worked for me. And that is in the trenches, roll up your sleeves. You are part of the team. No ivory tower, no astronaut architect. You're in the trenches. That's the only way I've ever been able to deliver. And that's for me, the only way that really works. That's another I could have a whole other session on what unfortunately has happened in the industry around EA uh, uh, practices getting further and further away from the gravity of, of what's actually going on on the ground. Maybe some of you have experienced that. Maybe some of you have uh, had to work in those scenarios. Uh, so that's why I, I love this stuff and, and what iDesign does because it is straight on, you know, uh, real deliverables, real artifacts, concrete bits, all that stuff rolled into one. And then for, for those of you who don't know, I'm also a trainer and teacher with, our, with uh, iDesign. I, treat, I teach the architecture and detailed design clinics, which I have one coming up next week. So this was all interesting from that perspective too, and I'll use some of this material um, in, in that class next week. And I also teach the Mysterious Service Fabric Masterclass. Uh, which is more about how to apply the method to a service mesh more than service fabric itself. 
And the last bullet is that I happen to live in the Philadelphia area in Pennsylvania in the States. And it just turns out that there is this huge critical mass of dot netters in the Philly area because the eastern side of Pennsylvania is actually butt up against a bunch of other states. And so being the largest metropolis in that area, all these devs kind of migrate when we have a code camp to the Philly area and uh, they run um, camps that, that rival national um, conferences. Of course, that, all that's been put on hold for quite a while. Uh, I bring that up because once you get to a certain point in your career, there's only there's there's no better way to test whether you're full of shit than to go out into the public forum, and if you got some idea, you know, actually go out and present. It's much easier to present than you might think, and it, there's no better way to hone your presentation skills than be standing up there in front of like a bunch of other people. So I encourage that as well, participation in your local community. And that's part of, you know, you guys are here for that very reason, because you are participating in the iDesign community, you know, in your respective organization and um, in your region. So that's a good thing. All right, enough about that nonsense. Now, the mission today is to hone our weapons of mass, uh, mass acceptance, which means how do we take this weird, you know, what seems to be conciliatory, little known uh, nugget of wisdom called the method, and how do we in, inject it into what could be a potentially hostile uh, landscape? As I mentioned, we're going to clarify why design is essential to that process and why it's lacking in the industry right now, what we mean by the process of design, just briefly. Um, Part of this is to give you guys these nuggets, what I call these little bits of wisdom that you keep in your back pocket. You, you can't, some of this stuff, you know, there could be tension, there could be political concerns. You could have your one moment with like a high level leader. And, and in that moment, the elevator pitch, you have to have it pre-canned because rarely will it come out right and you get it succinct if you're not prepared. So I say that because that happened to me, um, and it's happened to me earlier in my career more than once. So part of the language that's in here, you guys can pick out these little nuggets and have them in your back pocket. So when someone hits you with it, like Agile or DDD, or why do we need design in the first place, and what the hell is detailed design, you have these answers, and you can just you can just pull them out, and you can be nice and 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 on point. So that's part of the messaging. And then, like I mentioned, further on, we're going to identify techniques uh, that, that you can have productive and, and constructive conversations about Agile and DDD in the context of the method. And my three A's are what you're really trying to do is promote absorption, adoption, and then if you get to adoption, which means you're no longer having to sh like force them to do it, they adopt the techniques on their own and they're doing it on uh, you know, basically your behalf. Then you get to the, the vaulted area of um, advocacy, where they will start to advocate these, thought, these concepts on their own without you. And that's where really the grassroots thing starts to, you know, it's an exponential growth at that point. It only works if it really works. If it's all a bunch of hot air and it doesn't really work, you know, what's the point? And if whatever you're doing in a given culture isn't working, don't keep banging on it thinking that it should work. You've got a mold, which is in these slides, you've got to mold yourself to that, not the other way around. You'll never change anyone's mind and you will never force anyone to do anything. I'll let you just chew on that for a second. That means you have to come at it, at a, it's like Tai Chi, right? You've got to take what they, their energy and you just have to shift it through your body and bring it out the other side in a positive way uh and kind of and do that regeneration uh trust me it i know it sounds a little you know wacky but those kind of metaphors are very applicable because you know, i've done this so many times trust me i've been in the most hostile environments ever where you know and i'll tell you how i'm going to reveal to you you know what i do basically in those situations and then if there's time, uh, 
which this got a, I was tried. I originally told Kuna I was going to keep the deck uh, super tight, and that didn't happen. <laughs> because as I said, as I got into this, I, I really started having some insights on how to express what's going on. And I'll show you guys what's going on. And it's all good for us, right? Because the industry, as I mentioned, almost a decade ago, maybe not quite a decade ago, at least six or seven years ago, is walking in excruciating slow motion towards the method, whether they like it or not. And I'll show you how that's happening in real time. And in fact, the dates on some of these, this material that I'll show you is today. Someone on the team went into the page that I was copying images off of and updated the page while I was in the page. So it can't get any fresher than this or more relevant. Uh, lucky for us, it's all starts to look eerily familiar after a point. And you could you I'm, I'm bringing this up because and Kuhn knows this because I, uh, you know, I've I've worked with with some of the the other, you know, people deeply involved with the iDesign method. And, uh, and we did some katas. And those katas were meant for this very thing. Like, how do you really quickly like if you're presented with someone's DD architecture, how can you? uh spin the method equivalent quickly you know and and have a counter uh, argument against it so that was some of what's going on and the reason i'm picking on this particular um material is that i get hit with this material all the time it's the first thing they point at if they're a softy now it's not the only material for these you know ddd in particular because obviously there's a huge burgeoning um group and community using DDD outside, you know, the Microsoft small little sphere. But in the end, it's all the same. You know, so we'll look at that. All right, process of design. All good design is a process. And in that process is a spectrum of activities. And each activity is an aspect of the overall design. You can't look at one piece and say that that's the design. It's just part of the whole spectrum of design that's, that these modern systems require to uh, engender successful delivery. And you have to get comfortable with the fact that in each step, in each aspect of this spectrum and this process, you have to be able to iterate. No one, you know, you it, it never works that you're just going to generate the material and the artifacts in one quick motion. Process by its very nature and its definition is not a singular event. So to my point, you will never come to the easel and have the epiphany. You'll never come to PowerPoint, sit down in front of the static view and just make it happen. That's not the way it works. None of us do that, including Yuval. We all iterate on that. Everyone has their own techniques. How far do we go? You know, which way you do it? You do a little static, you do a little call change, you go back and forth, whatever feels natural. But you'll never, it, you, as soon as you realize there is a process involved and what a process means, then you can, you can leverage that. So this is what you'll not, you'll never come up with this and on the first sitting. It just won't happen, okay? Now this is actually in production and this is actually a archetypal pattern for point of sale systems that almost all of them look like this. That's a whole other topic that comes out of the method, but you'll never sit down. I didn't sit down and create this, uh, you know, in one fell swoop. It just doesn't happen. So the value identifying that design is in fact a process, then that establishes some sequence. And that makes it easier to grok because now each activity is smaller and you can come at it and you know what inputs you need for that activity and then what outputs will lead into the next step of the process. And we want a process, you know, including a methodology as part of that process because processes yield predictable outcomes. They have the clearly defined inputs and outputs, and that allows you to be more efficient, right? And I think 
if you really start to think about this, and some of these terms, it, it, depending on your culture that you're in, could be deemed as like dirty words, like design and process. Depending on how far the organization in the dev shop has embraced certain things and what Kool-Aid they've drank, um, it can be fascinating that what they throw out, you know, the babies they throw out with the bathwater. So, hold on a second. All right. Now, for me, what you what comes out of a process is this consistency, repeatability, and ultimately sustainability. And it turns out that my whole career is based on those three bullets. And that's both in design and in the code base. Now, a lot of devs don't like to hear that, but that's the truth. So any way you can engender consistency and repeatability in the code base, structure, design consistency, common pattern application, all yields, uh, ultimately yields sustainability over time. And the, it's the process that produces that consistency. Now, the other thing to contemplate, which we'll talk about more than, than the, the method for systems design, is that you guys might be more familiar with the architectural approach in the method, but it's the same thing with detailed design, meaning designing the code. You also have to design the code. How many people actually design the code? Very few, right? It's all gunslinging, bang on the keyboard. We can will ourselves to make it work. And everyone's smiling. I can see it. I, you know, I know what you guys are thinking. You're all smirking. You're like, yeah, I want to be that cowboy. I want to be that, uh, I am that ninja that can just whip out this code. And uh, that's, I can tell you firsthand that that's not how it gets done. You, ab you absolutely need a fair, if not significant, amount of technical acumen over time, but no one person is going to build the platform that I'm currently working on. It would never happen. You are not going to be an expert in all the varied technologies, including a graph database. It's not going to happen. So this, I'm bringing this up because you, if you if you run into these types, you ha obviously have to find a way uh, to leverage them within the plan, but you also have to mitigate the fact that you know they will think that they can just code their way out of any paper bag, and that's not true. Case in point is what really you want is people who can design. Uh, so that's that's an essential aspect of of being able to do that. And I bring up the whole gunslinger thing because early in my career, I was straight out. I just had a bad attitude and I was a gunslinger and I can sling some code. But I got to a point in my career where people were passing me by and I hit a glass ceiling. And I realized when I finally had some leadership responsibility that that was not going to get it done. So I just bring that up as an aside for all the gunslingers out there. Not that you have to put away your guns, but you might just need to use them in a different way. Now, what's also on here is that what we're trying to engender, so it's really not about you. It's about our, all the technical leadership kind of operating uh, in a similar way to engender consistency. And that then rolls to the teams, and then the teams roll to the division or the group, and then the groups roll to the division, and the divisions roll to the region. I mean, if you're in an organization that, that large, that's how it works. Now, what we do at iDesign is we always start this process with a team pilot, and that team pilot, um, largely the iDesign architect runs the first three months, and then we do a slow, gradual handover to the apprentice. In that three months, what do you think we spend the most time on? Anyone? You could just blurt it out. Detailed design, because it's the most time consuming. 
And what, where do we do most of this? In PRs. Or if you have, you know, depending on the culture, uh, I strongly advocate pair programming on the branch long before because the, the PR is too late. If it's a junior handoff or another handoff, you want to get into that branch, you want to pair up, you want to work, you leave each other's comments, you work on the branch, you do the detailed design, you tweak it in rapid success, like rapid iterations, and then the PR is actually for formal review by other people. But in a team pilot, I spend three months doing detailed design. And that's getting into everyone's PRs. So it's a lot of work, right? The design is already done. It, that doesn't take any time at all. The architecture, no time. The, the PD, no time. The rest of it is detailed design and trying to teach people how to do it meaningfully. So that's why I'm, I'm and, the, and the only way I've found to be able to transfer that knowledge is through the process. Now, it's interesting to observe, you know, which is always the case with software because we're just this nubile um, discipline and, and we have, you know, we have big egos, but little uh, substance. All the other design schools that are actually uh, about design, they all teach a process. It's like design school 101, except it's completely lost on software that there is a process to design and there's multiple things you need to design. You know, so that's why I'm kind of bringing this up because when I go, you know, I see a bunch of different organizations as do probably many of you, no one's doing design. No one even talks about designing the code at all. Every once in a while you might hear a little bit about a pattern or something like this, but most of it's just tech and code like hell. But you guys, I hope you appreciate, right, that if you're a great coder, but a poor designer, what happens? You may get it to work for the first initial thing, and all you've done is create a boatload of tech debt for the, the subsequent 10 years. Or if you're an average coder, but you're really good at design, I mean, you, you actually take, you, you invest in that extra time to think about the code, then we know that that actually produces a better result. However, it may not be the fastest result. So that's something you have to plan for. And again, as you've already heard, probably you know, in any iDesign cl class, instead of programming in tech, you should actually focus on design because all those other things change. The language changes, the tech changes, but if you can design around any of those things, then uh, it's really good for your career. Now, what I meant by a design is a spectrum. If you think about the overarching iDesign methodology, we actually go from architecture So we go from the architecture into the plan and then into detailed design. In addition to that, we use a separate set of tools. We go from diagramming into spreadsheets, you know, and project, and then into the code. So this is the architecture. Many of you may be familiar with, you know, what this looks like, the static view, the runtime view, and then this is a plan. This is a really nice plan, by the way. That is one sick shallow S, and that's one killer resource uh, distribution. And if you squint really closely, you'll see that that this is actually um, 0.59 risk with an 18% efficiency of an overall duration of 18 months, ironically, which is the magic number for all. Um, software project of su sufficient size. You should know that they all take 18 months, whether you like it or not. And it has what, 77 uh, activities. That is one sweet plan. With those, I bring those metrics up because what you see on the screen is exactly why we do PD. And is that plan sane?
And what I just described to you is a very sane plan. All right. Now, this is detail design. So it may not be clear to you, but what's on the screen right now is the uh, primary interface for carding engine. <clears throat> so we got behavior. And we also may have interaction diagrams, depending on the nature of your handoff. This is an incredibly valuable um, element of, of detailed design. Now, what's on here, this is for uh, a different system, but you get the gist. And it's a balance between this and this. <clears throat> so if you really need to understand what the behaviors are, so that's what's happening. What you see here is that you're actually seeing both the facet, I mean, the interface and the behavior. Now, there's not enough, uh, it's, in, it's inappropriate to put, you know, DTO detail on something like this, but you at least get to see the interactions uh, without having to look at the code. So you can make a boatload of decision, which is why we diagram things. It takes Once you have the template, it takes very little time to build these things, but you should also be doing that. And I, have, I know, of course, that, uh, that Copper does this uh, for you almost automatically, which is cool. Now, the idea here is this spectrum is still one singular design, just different elements, like I said. You can't really think of them as separate, and each aspect influences the other. This is where the iteration comes in. So you want to get good upstream, so you do less iteration downstream. But that doesn't mean that if you get into planning and, and you have like this tension point in the plan, with, which often happens, as you know, for those of you who have taken um, PDMC at the manager level, that you have to fix it or the utilities. So there's classic plays that come out of that with milestones, et cetera. And sometimes it also might mean that your architecture is unright. So you get comfortable with this and you should be comfortable going back and fixing and refining the step before. Detailed design will also influence the plan. Once you know your resources and now you suddenly are faced with a severe junior handoff, that's a new plan. Okay, and the where in you decide to do detailed design, which is beyond the scope of this session, but is what we dwell on in the detailed design clinic. Uh, we actually do exercises around that. So we'll talk about it briefly here, but that that's why it's a spectrum. You can't look at design uh, in reality as uh, as uh, isolated uh, aspects. And as we noted, each one has a different tool set, different inputs and outputs. Now, the other thing that's really interesting here is that what you're noticing is that each also has a varying degree of granularity appropriate to the task. And a lot of teams, I, I, I call this out because a lot of um, alternate design approaches actually get this wrong because they try to do all the things at the same time, but that, that doesn't work. There's an appropriate level of granularity for each step. So you look at the architecture, this is very coarse grained. We're looking at components and relationships, and we refine those, of course, with a method by volatility, and we time box it. The plan is at another level of granularity. We take that, that box, and then we either break it into multiple activities, or at least that activity for building a certain facet on carting engine, has its own set of smaller, more granular tasks. And then we refine that by time, cost, and risk. And it's also time boxed. And then finally, detailed design is where we're building the scaffolding for the actual system. We're making the call chains real. Those call chains are not abstract art, uh, diagrams. They are actual literal blueprints for the code. And so in a healthy, mature method environment, if you will fail uh, code review, if it if your manager doesn't abide by that call chain for that given use case. And of course, the detail is where it's very fine grained all the way down to the last DTO property. That's why it's very time consuming. So you have to make it efficient.
So in an overarching kind of iterative um, schematic, this is what we're talking about. We're kind of iterating through the design portion and the build portion. For those of you who are taking the AMC, this is straight out of the AMC. This is actually how it works um, in real life all the time. You get some level of ambiguous marketing requirements. It's either, a, uh, and we're gonna show this briefly, then someone, someone has to take the ambiguous marketing requirements and, and interpret them into what we might call the derived requirements or more accurately, the engineering requirements. And then we have to model those so we can visualize them. You know, so the use cases are always best expressed as flowcharts. And then that passes into the architectural phase where we have the interaction diagrams, the static architecture, and then those inform both the, the abstractions and the code. Now, if we do this slightly differently, this is really what we're talking about. More times than not, we actually, the runtime aspect of the call chains, and then the static aspect, of course, is the static uh, view. And when we do this, what we're deriving the interfaces and classes. And what we do most often is we drive this detailed design process by the call chains, because that's where the relationships are. Now, as I mentioned, <clears throat> depending on the nature and the complexity of that call chain, you should do interaction diagrams as well, which I think most of you are familiar with. And the reason is that this, this particular call chain, when done right and in properly encapsulating volatilities and use cases, re represents a number of use cases, the nuance of which, the detail of which is beyond the scope of that diagram. That's why we need an interaction diagram per use case because the facet might be different, the behavior might be different, meaning the operation and even the DTOs. And that's what we're driving for that clarity in that interaction diagram. Okay, that's an important distinction. We use both kind of call chains and interaction diagrams. Now, notice what just happened. So it's a little subtle. Notice where the business line moves. So in reality, what often happens is that it's engineering's responsibility to also formalize the use cases. And then it may also be your responsibility to go all the way to the engineering requirements. The essence of this is that the iDesign method re requires you to be active. I've, I call this out because you don't know how many times I get into organizations where the devs have this really just horrible attitude that it's the business's responsibility to magically lay the requirements in every final detail in your lap like it's, like it's a, the, you know, stone tablets. That's not the way it works. In fact, it's the businesses, we want the business doing the business stuff. And what are they good at? schmoozing clients and making money and getting new clients. That's what they're supposed to be doing and being on the golf course, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's what they should be doing. They should not be spending hours creating use cases. So depending on the nature of your culture, you have to adapt to that and you have to be active. Now you need that information because of this arrow, which is saying like, well, this is the, this is the process and this thing leads into this thing, and then this thing leads into this thing, and you know, so forth and so on. So you got, you have to get it. And if they don't give it to you, meaning that you go into Jira and the story ticket has nothing in it, that's not their fault. You need to drive, like, you need to drive that. Be assertive. Be tactful, of course, but. The, the point here is that I'm just overemphasizing this because it is a problem. It is not their responsibility. Ideally, it's a joint effort, and that's where good things happen. That's why, what do we start the whole process with at the very beginning before we even derive the architecture? What do we do? Anyone? Interviewing. Interviewing, thank you. Yes. 
That's why we interview. Because we want to hear it for real again. And it may be costly. It may be redundant. I don't care. I need to hear it. Even if there's a 300-page spec beautifully crafted sitting in your CMS, I still need to hear it. So that's the essence of, of you know, actually taking ownership of some of this aspect. And we're going to see why this is so important later. Now, for DD, now we're going to get into detailed des design. Um, not DDD, but detailed design. Um, and I'm going to focus on this because this is the real hard part. You know, you guys may be all in a different uh, phase in your journey with the method, understanding the architectural size, system design, PD. But now here is usually the most, most confusing and vexing part. So this is where construction starts. You pick, you roll up your sleeves, you pick up the hammer, and you start framing the house. And you are starting to code. Code is the best tool for your detailed design. And if you go to the DDC, you'll get sick of hearing me say, just start sketching. You have a block called some manager, like sales manager. Just start. Go into code, create a file, and create something called I sales manager with empty curly braces. That's sketching. And then from there, it all follows. If you don't start that, you'll never get to the point of being comfortable and iterating quickly. So that's vitally important. Again, for the team or for your client or for whoever you're evangelizing to, this is the moment where all the talk and hand waving and, and nonsense becomes concrete. This is the point where something real ends up with the name sales manager. And then there is an interface as an initial facet with the way to actually inter interact with that component. And at that moment, you can already, with only that, with a class name sales manager, colon, I sales manager, empty, empty uh, curly braces, you can have a meaningful conversation with, so, with a dev that says, this little yellow box is this code in no uncertainty. And this arrow from the, from the shopping portal is this call from the API to the sales manager facet to this operation for this specific use case. And suddenly, you know, the C parts and the clarity just becomes so much more tangible. That's why I design drives too, as you know, like when we do this, you know, we strive to do the vertical slice at the end of the week. And it's there to have that conversation, dispel disbelievers that the, that the wacky little uh, straw man stick figure diagram is real, <clears throat> what it all means. And it is by far the best training material and marketing tool that you could ever use. You know, and I know, I know that uh, those in Ilionics, you know, they've got this baked down to a science because copper just kind of spits it all out and that's like magic. So they, they make my efforts uh, when, when Barton and, and Vooters were in, in the DDC and they, they did the same thing with copper at the same time I was fiddling around with my IFX, you know, it just, it was embarrassing. Downright embarrassing. So as they would say in the American South or West. So <clears throat> it, you guys are already, for those of you with that tool in your back pocket, that's incredibly powerful. Now, the other thing that we're doing here is you're also revealing technical competency. You're making it code, which very rarely do any other architects do. And this is already starting to solidify your design and process leadership um, capabilities, as well as your technical leadership. So it's all part of the equation. Now, just a moment on vertical slice. And, the, and some of these slides are directly out of the DDC. So there are actually three types of vertical slice. And it depends on the nature of, of your, your culture, the need for the vertical slice, how quickly you need to have these conversations, all this kind of stuff. You could do an abstract vertical slice, which is just an expression of that call chain, no domain detail whatsoever. 
but it actually shows how it works and what those arrows do, right? And you can produce it incredibly quickly to have those conversations. You wanna, you wanna establish the credibility of all this work almost immediately. Now, there's a domain specific, the opposite end, which is almost the legitimate first V1 of that actual use case. So you spend all this extra time to go in there, the, the behaviors are real. You've done the interaction diagrams. You've had all this discussion with you know, additional um, uh, interviews with the, with the appropriate people on what this thing should do across the whole entire call chain. The DTOs are real. <clears throat> you may, it may even do real stuff. You may even do the schema for the, for the databases at the bottom or, or the third party calls. Like, it is incredibly, it is literally, for, but for only one use case, right? So that's a key thing. It's still faster than doing the whole entire subsystem, but yet it has incredible volume of detail. Now, the most thing, the most frequent thing that we do is a hybrid, where as appropriate, we had, you know, and maybe it might be by component, particularly calling out the more complex components, you may spend more time on their detailed design to flesh out the reality. Or if it's a platform and you're using the strategy pattern and you're doing multi-level strategies, because there's both, there's incredible volume of, of variance in, let's say, it's a, it's a healthcare system and there's a huge variance between the type of partners as well as where you're getting some information. You might want to highlight that in the vertical slice. However, so you dwell on that particular component, but maybe uh, some of the other things that are low hanging fruit, you only do uh, a very abstract DD for. And that allows you to have these, you know, that allows you to jumpstart the more complex aspects of the plan and have meaningful conversations around those early, as early as possible. Now, there is a process to detailed design, just like there's a process to system design. It, as, as Yuval loves to say, during system design, we throw the spec out. You know, you've all, anyone who's gone to AMC has heard that or secondhand has heard that. It's not true. What we actually do is we put the spec on the shelf. <clears throat> Why do we put it on the shelf? Because eventually we need all that detail. We cannot derive an architecture from 300 page spec. You will never get done. That's why we put it on the shelf and we prefer to, to run the process of interviewing and looking for areas of, of change and, and, uh, and pain points and all that good stuff. Detailed design, now we pull the proverbial spec off the shelf. That means there's another round of interviewing and gathering details, most likely with a different approach to interviewing and for, with different people. Sketching is critical, accounting for the team, handoff point, refine the plan, as I mentioned earlier, then you have to learn to communicate all this. You might have the most kick-ass detailed design ever, but if you can't explain the rationale behind why it works and why it's better than anything else, it's not gonna go very far. Same with architecture, of course. And then finally, you build some of it. That's where the vertical slices come in. Now, what does it mean to pull the spec off the shelf? Well, that depends on your culture. You could have a spec. You could have nothing, not even anything in the backlog, right? So it's a huge spectrum of the interpretation, what I mean by spec. It's really about your culture. Now, this is the point where we still have to do it, like I mentioned before, and that's why I was, I was dwelling on that in those, those diagrams earlier, because this is what I'm really talking about. If you're in a culture where you're not getting anything, it's your job to drive to get that more detail. Now, what are we looking for? Use cases, data, third-party interactions. You can use previous models as a reference if it's brownfield. Everything's in play. Now, the important thing is that, of course, we don't if you if you follow the previous if it's a brownfield in particular and you pro, you follow the previous system verbatim then you'll do nothing but recast the old problems in the new system so you would just want to refer to it what are the data points you're recasting all the dto's most likely and the way the the service boundaries work 
the operations and their relationships. Even if you think you know, you should still go out and actually do some gathering and some interviewing just to corroborate your story. And now what's happening here is that middle bullet, it is actually becoming the nuts and bolts of the system. We're going from the abstract architecture into the schematic, into the actual uh, detailed engineering diagram on how this code works or how the system actually operates at a much granular level. Enough said there, I've already harped on that. The essence here is that the unique thing with detailed design process is that it's another round of interviewing. You don't interview for the architecture to understand the data points. If you find yourself interviewing for data points while you're doing the architecture, you'll never get done. That's what we practice in the architecture clinic. Most people go way down to the curly braces during those interviews. That's inappropriate uh, level of detail. Here, if there's like uh, 100,000 lines of code and a 15-year-old code base, it's the spec. The code is the spec. It's the truth. Someone's got to figure it out. That's time consuming. And in the DVC, we actually talk about code analysis. Code analysis, for anyone who's done it before, know, they know, everyone knows that it's far more expensive than actually writing the code in the first place to try to understand what the code does by looking at the code in a large code base that you may not be familiar with. So you have to get efficient at that. And I share techniques in the DVC on how I do that. Most of what I've done with the, with the method has been Brownfield. And it works amazingly well. But you got to plan for it. So again, this is really what we're trying to derive. Operations, data points, third-party API interactions, sketches from previous iterations. And again, we're just iterating over all of this. You know, so we and we use the call chain to drive that process, right? So in the DDC, we break this apart. Um, you know, you you have to come at this in a certain way. You'll even by aspect layer, you may need to talk to different people in the organization to find out the details. There may be prior art for ordering engine sitting in three different places in two different languages and on three different calls st uh, tech stacks. Right, you hear you hear what I'm saying. You also try to derive this as well during, and you use this uh, these kind of uh, interaction diagrams to to highlight the the interactions. And again, this is really this is all detailed design. So we're driving it using the architecture. We're deriving the interactions. We're also uh, establishing the behavior and the DTOs. This is detailed design. The end result is a bunch, your, your interface class for your service with a fully vetted set of facets and DTOs, as much as you can get. And that's the truth of the matter. You're never going to get it 100% because uh, you'll never get done. But you can get it close enough, and then you have the confidence that what you've, what you've done, filling it in with the appropriate patterns and the method uh, in your back pocket, <clears throat> the remaining missing details will not break the architecture. Now, same goes for APIs. I'm just saying. So this is another critical problem in, in the industry at large as well, where no one, um, I see, See developers who actually grok the solid pattern uh, principles. They do really good interface factoring. And then I, I see the controllers that they create and they're a disaster. It's a, it's a dumping ground of garbage. It's just another service and a controller. It's in the name, application programming interface. A controller is just another facet. When you start to apply the same thing in all the layers, regardless of the technology stack, it all starts to look the same after a while. This one, however, is not designed well, and I should have shown what's down below. There is an operation down below on this particular controller that's called flow async. So that's where the goodness lies. So this is like the old explicit call chain expressed as explicit uh, behavioral endpoints in the API. And then flow takes that and just does the goodness with it. 
then you you know then you can sunset all of this and there's one there's literally one method in the in the controller and we'll see why that's valuable and where that comes from shortly <clears throat> all right so that in a nutshell that is the value of design right now, why do I bring this up, of course, because depending on, again, the nature of the environment you find yourself in, the culture, et cetera, et cetera, there may be, there may be a maturity around design. Most often, my experience, there is no design going on whatsoever. No one designs the code. And there may, in fact, be a very little bit even design of the system. So that's why I'm, um, this is the conversation and this is the rationale behind why you should do design. And there's a magic word when you come to this, it's an investment. And you tie that investment in monetary terms to technical debt, which you could put a dollar sign to. And once you put dollar signs to things, then the business grocks it. It's an investment. That's how I, that's my, one of my favorite words when I start to inject these ideas into hostile environments. Most of the time there's, you know, they actually, it, it causes uh, even the most staunch um, agile scrum master to pause, right? And then, you know, we're going to talk about the next step. So anyone have any questions about the value of design. I know this is kind of like preaching to the choir, but again, this is actually, we're all gaining a common message. You're hearing the way that I, I do this for real in those slots. I, I explain things this way. There's more coming, of course, when I get into the more details, but in the essence, if, there, if I go into a shop and there is actually no pr practice for design, I start there. Like, why would you, uh, do you think coding like hell is actually going to solve anything? Martin? Uh, when you start to talk about this investment in design, do you do you normally need to quantify this somehow, or is it just to explain then the concept of debt and investment? Yeah, it's quantify can be a challenge. Um, but again, you know you may have you may have some. And, and each environment is different, so it's hard to take um, quantified results from a previous environment and apply them here. But it, it, a lot of it is anecdotal. But when you frame it, from my experience, when you frame it properly and actually make it an issue in the first place, most of the time they don't even realize that they're not designing anything. And then you stop and say, look, well, it's pretty important to do this, and here's why. Then that causes pause, and sometimes it, you know, can inspire uh, change just by acknowledging that you should be doing this. Uh, other times, you know, what I honest, I often do <clears throat> when I get into a new environment is that even, and, and you're 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 going to hear more of this later. I go right to the code base. I analyze the code base. I see the pain points. I, quanti I, I categorize the pain points, and then I have those as discussion points. When, when the topic will arise, like, you know, I, I went into this one controller, and there's 150 operations. There's name getters. Um, there's address setters. There's redundant ones by, by, by phone platform. Uh, is this working? And you know the result, right? And that's all it takes. So the essence here is like, you don't do, you don't, you don't just, so in every shop, I always establish two things. Some things are non-negotiable and there shall be no complaint without contribution. So that goes for you too. You can't just go into the code base and say, oh, this sucks. You have to have the rationale as to why it sucks and what, how you would fix it. Right. So that's the rationale for for kind of going in there and, and picking out a few low hanging fruit, which they're inevitably, from my experience of doing this for a decade, I'm probably going into at least 60, you know, 70 different code bases. It's all the same. And at this point, I get so tired of it. I just go into the code base. I start poking around in the APIs. I don't even have to go any further. And I'm just like. 
And then I have to just kind of calm myself and steel myself for the inevitable long uh, painful haul that may or may not actually come to fruition about the reality of what's going on. And we're going to talk about that. Any other questions? You don't get any of this right coming to the easel and have an epiphany. You don't get any of it right coding like hell. And, it, and that's all so exorbitantly costly. I can't even, you, you know, just in, in, intuitively that if you try to figure this stuff out by coding those, those behaviors and all the, against all those DTOs and then realizing it's wrong and then having to code it again and then having to code it again in comparison to doing it with the abstract behaviors, some interaction diagrams, a really abstract call chain uh, diagram in a PowerPoint and some DTOs, you, you just know inherently which one takes less time. Because what's inside that behavior is already encapsulated. In a, you know, behind a facade, you know, the, and the design of that code is separate from all this other stuff. The real pain point are those arrows. It's the integration that's the pain point, not what's inside. That's what everyone gets wrong. Everyone starts from inside and then tries to figure out the integrations when they should do it the exact opposite, right? That's what the, the, the method tries to solve. All right, any other questions? All right, now on to the more entertaining portions of the session, the Agile. Now, there's going to be a, a reoccurring theme here because almost every, in, every environment that I've gone into has been some level of Agile. So I've done this a lot. And they are not mutually exclusive at all. The only thing that the method does is provides a clarifying lens on what are the activities and tasks. What are the what is what should be in the backlog? Most importantly, what is the prioritization of of all the stuff in the backlog? And what is the inherent risk of any given backlog or any given epic? Right? Any given release. Now the one thing that's always missing in agile and if, if, you, if you've ever seen any health, healthy Agile um, um, practice do this, I'd love to hear about it. But from my experience, the one vitally important thing that's always missing in the backlog is dependency tree. There is no association of those stories, epics in the backlog to each other and how they relate at all. That's why you can end up you know, so in the when I teach an architecture clinic, when I get to the seminal point of the functional uh, decomp slide, my favorite analogy is the pagoda to your microwave, which means the story says I need to cook a frozen dinner. So the team decides the way you're going to do that is with a microwave. So you build a little pad with the cement. You put the 110 power on it. You put a you build a little stand for the microwave, and then you put a pagoda over it for the weather. Click, click, double click, done. Sprint, done. Ship it. What do you need? What What do you realize right after that that you missed? It's a frozen dinner. Where do I put the refrigerator? So you tear the whole thing down, you add to the slab. Now you need 210 power in the States and you put the refrigerator right next to the little stand for the microwave and then you rebuild the pagoda. Click, click, double click, done. This is how we build software. Tell me if I'm wrong. I challenge all of you. I'd love to hear that, you're, that I'm wrong. I wish I was wrong. I see this play out in excruciating cost and pain so many times. Uh, you know, I already, you already heard me sigh. It's because no one actually associates the relative dependencies in the backlog. Now, the thing that has solved this, I don't have it in the slide deck, but many of you have heard this. The thing that has helped me in, in even the most ha hostile, agile environment to kind of fix that 
is design big, build small. And I usher that, I, I, I kind of, you know, declare that to, to the, uh, the Agile teams or the Agile Scrum Masters, and they're curious because it sounds very Agile-y. So like, well, what does that mean? Build small sounds good, but what does is, what is design big mean? And I'm like, well, all you really need to do, let's go back into the backlog and look at all the stories or the epics that are kind of related to each other. And let's design against that group instead of just the one we're working on right now. So it, that's where the dependencies come out of. Then when you do that broader scope and design, and then you say like, we're not gonna go through and write and build all this stuff. We're just gonna, we're just gonna use this to kind of inform the design. Good things happen. All right, now, this is what I always do. You always have to do the right thing, regardless of cl culture. That means that you always have your method-informed architecture, PD, and DD in your back pocket. <clears throat> However, depending on the nature of the culture, you may need to use significant discretion, including the political landscape. Now, I already harped on being active. And in this, when you use discretion, what that means is both tact and guile. So that's that's key. You, I, there's been many environments where I never uttered the word volatility. I never uttered the word project design. I may not have even uttered the word architecture. And I definitely didn't utter the word method. And yet, I got them to do what they needed to do in their vernacular and even maybe their architectural approach. So that's what we're talking about. Sometimes you have to be very clandestine uh, in that and guile effectively in that regard because you know what's right. And if they're missing the backlog prioritization and dependency tree, you know how it's going to play out. You're going to be building pagodas forever at incredible cost and you'll never make your deadlines. Again, I already harped on active. Now, the way I, I've had the greatest success injecting design and planning into the release planning ceremony. And and I'll and I'll I have a little uh, some quotes later that that kind of highlight that. And in addition to that, you can be doing DD in in a variety of ways. Uh, you can either do it up front or in flow, and we do pro we practice this in the detail design. It's ideally based on the type of project and the team handoff point you have, either green or brown or junior and senior. And you can create a little matrix of these things, and then that actually informs you when you should do certain things and to what degree of uh, information you should obtain. Nothing wrong with the whole. Uh, approach of discussing things in, in epics, ta stories, tasks. It's just another way to document the requirements. If you're not getting the sufficient detail, like I mentioned earlier, it's your responsibility, show them. Create a template for the ticket. Maybe multiple templates for different tickets. This is what, you know, template for some logic looks like. This is what an access, uh, like, you know, an accessor's uh, template should look like. This is the information we actually need to do this, to do this ticket. Again, it's not the form of the information, but the content that's relevant. And again, it's your job to find it if it's missing. Scrum, same thing. All, use all the tools and, and tact and guile at your disposal. I always have a PD. Always. You can then just start, you know, if you just, you don't, you may not even have a lot of influence. We just start suggesting things. Shouldn't we do this before that? Doesn't this depend on this? I think we should do these stories in this order because of this. And usually everyone's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And it just happens. You have no idea that that's the way it should happen without a project design, right? 
Those little arrows on the call chains are gold. And again, you can put the features together, stories, multiple stories into an epic, however the, you know, and everyone does this differently. They are actually milestones in your PD. You can fill the activities in the sprint. When you get down to two weeks, you can only do so much in two weeks. That means you're down at the facet level now in your detailed design. What facets are we going to work on? Meaning what, you know, what are we going to fill in in this time frame? What collection of use cases we can, can we actually achieve, you know, with the velocity of this team in two weeks? Your PD tells you all of that. There's also a lot of iDesign alumni who use mini PDs. They'll actually create a two week PD. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, you are guiding and influencing. You're doing the right thing. And as I said, most often it has to do with um, dependencies. You don't know that until you do the PD. And then it's a prioritization thing. And you can drive this and suggest these things. You know, and these are some of the actual phrases I use. The, the messaging and the ter and terminology, the comments I make like in release planning. The last one was a gem because that introduced float into the backlog. And that's the only way that you can manage risk. Because Agile has no concept of risk. What is the risk in every Agile project? 100%. Because all it does is, is stack the stories on top of each other. There is no space between them unless you inject it. The only way to control risk in a dynamic project is through float. So that, that line is literally from that project where I said, you know, everyone's suffering from DevOps. Let's put some DevOps stories into this uh, release. And if the, you know, so the, the business is like, well, what if there are no DevOps issues? And we're like, well, then they can start early on other stuff. Uh, or maybe they can do some learning or, or, or like learn this or do a POC or something else. And it worked out incredibly well. It was pretty cool to see, and I, you know, uh, it. You know, I, who knows? I, I just took a guess. <clears throat> I just used that opportunity. And again, you know, it's like the other one above it. Like, doesn't this purchase purchasing logic depend on like these three accessors? Shouldn't we do these first and vet out their their DD maybe to understand what the models look like? <clears throat> and then maybe we should look at the use case and kind of come down from the top. How how are we using purchasing it? Should we do these things in this order? Good Agile is the method in the end of the day. So there are some questions. Uh, these are from uh, Stefan. Um, but, you know, I, hopefully I've answered most of this. Like, <clears throat> where does the task granularity come from? That comes from you have a PD, and then you figure out what you can honestly do in a, in a span of a sprint. So between the PD and the detailed design you have, that would determine like how much you can actually get done. Earned value, that's a dicey proposition um, because that require that does require a little more buy-in by the organization to actually track EV. <clears throat> so that's a that's a hard one to kind of introduce. You know, that's that's actually uh, I've had you know mixed results trying to introduce EV tracking uh, into Agile shops. It's absolutely more valuable than than burn down because burn down doesn't really tell you much other than you know this is kind of the relative velocity and and we're either going to make it or we're not going to make it <clears throat> it doesn't give you those those insights on how to fix the problem that's really what ev is for and again you know i've given you a little insight on how to capture requirements and then translate those into stories um, you just you it's just a tool for recording stuff. You know, it can be in a document, it can be in the wiki, it can be in Jira tickets, it can be wherever it makes sense in the culture that you're in. The important thing is that you do it. And that depending as as we saw in those earlier slides, 
<clears throat> that you are active and you go do it. Um, you know, so I've been in, in, in many shops where we eventually, you know, we have templates for the tickets. And even if they're method based, there is a ticket for an, for, uh, an engine, a, a specific ticket template for an access component. Same for the manager, utilities, IFX. This is what we need. <clears throat> and then you don't put all that in the ticket, of course. There are ancillary documents in the CMS that, that you refer to, right? All right, any other questions on Agile in, in the method? Stefan? Hi, Montia. Uh, thanks for the explanation there. It was really uh, insightful. Yeah, what I also noted with uh, the team when I started explaining the idea of okay, breaking it down into um, blocks of five days, and then immediately they, you know, they took uh, that very literally as well with the pendul uh, pendulum effect, and they tried to break everything down into days of uh, or blocks of five days to to keep that going, and eventually it started getting to this very artificial way of estimation. It was like, oh yeah, we need to get all these tasks to add up to two, five days to get the, the earned value at the end of the day. And um, yeah, do you have any suggestions there? How do you actually do the estimations then while having the product project design in your back pocket to sort of get them to to align actually, you know, with with your uh, estimations? Yeah, that's that's a little more of a science. So I, I appreciate that, you know, because you may not get to do, you may have to do kind of like random interviewing at, at an, in an agile ceremony to kind of derive how long things are going to take, right? So that's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I'll definitely admit, uh, admit that. Um, and again, for project design, estimation is always the pain point. So just like DT, DD is uh, detailed design is hard from a design perspective for project design estimation is the hard part. And every team that we ever interact with has to go through a, um, a process of recalibrating their estimations. And it's really based on the project, on the team composition, all those kind of things rolled into one. And it usually takes them, unfortunately, like a couple iterations before they, they, they kind of tighten the estimation process. That being said, a good PD is not solely uh, dependent on the, on the estimations. The problem comes in when you're one, one or more standard deviations away from reality. And that most, is, most often is chronic underestimation. So that's the thing you really have to look at. Um, what most, you know, to your point is that everything becomes five days, even an engine and multiple facets that probably should take 20. That's where you really have to, to kind of, and then you have to mold that into, into the, into agile. And that's where facets come in uh, as to try to make those things more granular. And so what I've done in that case, um, fitting them into a sprint, only doing, like I said, certain facets or even certain operations on a facet. And then if it's a complex component, then the first time you hit it in release planning or in like the sprint before when you're doing uh, like kind of inflow planning, you have to suggest that, well, to do these operations is going to require us to do a bunch of this additional work. Like maybe we have to do a repository pattern in the access, or maybe there's some IFX that needs to be done. So there's a bunch of extra work hiding in that box. And so that's why I, I, I try to encourage uh, them to kind of look inside, the, inside that activity and maybe call that out and realize that maybe we can only do like a certain portion of that in this sprint. In the next sprint, you know, we'll be able to finish things out. So... There's no easy answer for that one, uh, particularly around estimations. <clears throat> the only thing that I've gotten, the thing that's helped me the most with estimation um, is, is just using the, the task, the smaller tasks for the activities 
you know, as they're in the uh, EV example, and the, the art of getting more accurate estimations is the smaller the task, the more accurate the estimation. So if you've got, if you're doing like a big heavy facet and it's the first time you're hitting carting engine and you know carting engine is complex, you know, that you, you kind of use that uh, and in the discussion with the estimation and then you see, okay, well, how long is it going to take? Let's look at the detailed design. Let's look at uh, if we have to do any additional requirements gathering, then the coding, then the unit testing, then the integration testing, right? And then if you break each one of those down, each one of those estimations gets a little more accurate. Any other questions? All right. And again, if you have any subsequent questions around this, uh, excuse me, uh, you know, feel free uh, to shoot them to Kuhn and then Kuhn can pass them to me and, uh, you know, I'm happy to address them. All right, now, the other 800-pound gorilla waiting for you uh, in, in, the, uh, in any given environment is DDD. Again, just like Agile, you, my answers may surprise you. Let's consider that the goals of DDD and the method are very similar. They're much more similar, in fact, than any kind of shop that doesn't abide by any given architectural approach or that uses a purely functional based approach. Sorry about that, I need another cough drop. So let's start with that premise, right? So the idea here is honing our weapons of mass acceptance. So we're not gonna come in and say like, oh, you know, DDD sucks and everything you have sucks. That's not gonna get us anywhere. Let's look at the two. And basically what I did during the COVID downturn in the middle of 2020 <clears throat> was I did uh, a multi-month uh, DDD deep dive in the industry at large. And I did that because early on in my career, I had actually used DDD. And, you know, I found the method, you know, much better um, of a solution. And in addition to that, um, you know, I hadn't used, I, I understood it well enough, but I hadn't looked at what was, what was coming out of, uh, you know, DDD currently. And so we'll look at that uh, a little bit later. So for those of you who, uh, who are familiar with it, you know that the DDD uh, basically uh, desires to encapsulate the system capabilities by business context, right? So we look at the business, we look at the information, we look at some of the language, and we try to isolate that by context. <clears throat> and then we put an explicit boundary around that context. And Using those two basic techniques, then we, we start to decompose the broader system into what uh, are called bounded contexts. And there's just some rules or simple rules around bounded contexts, in particular that they each have their own conceptual model of the subdomain, meaning you know, like the data scape and the behaviors, and that they uh, ideally encapsulate data access and logic into what are called domain services. In contrast, the method, or in similarity actually, the method uh, you know, desires to encapsulate system capability by business volatility. And then we isolate that volatility within an explicit boundary. And then we de decompose the system by what you might call bounded volatility. Everything has a boundary. Nothing is like one giant thing. Everything has a boundary, regardless of whether it's a bounded context or you know it's an uh, I designed method architecture. And then with the volatilities, they also 
uh, possess their own conceptual models. And they, in, they also uh, encapsulate the data and logic in layered service volatilities. So there's like a subtle little difference there. But, you know, at a certain level, they're both trying to achieve, there's some kind of process to actually uh, decompose the system into things that are isolated. You know, so that's the goal. So there, we have a lot more in common with the DDD camp than we may think. Now, of course, we have to talk about the V word. And if you Google volatility, this is the first definition that comes up from the Ox Oxford uh, Dictionary. And this is just so such a gem that it perfectly exp explain, explains the state uh, or the what doesn't work in software. Every word is actually just resonates with what goes wrong in a software project. The liability to change rapidly and unpredictably, especially for the worse. Now, if that doesn't define every software project, like, so li even the choice of words, liability, change rapidly, unpredictably for the worse. What, it could not be any better definition of volatility than what we mean, uh, what we're attempting to encapsulate. Now, we can't talk about DDD circa 2021 without talking about microservices. And now this is where the problems start. And I actually had a conversation with Eric Evans and he's admitted even publicly that, yeah, the, the classic concepts in DDD is always not quite translated in their entirety to service orientation. They worked really well in object orientation, but not so much once you get to distributed systems. But yet it was still the only, you know, uh, architectural process that the broader industry had a handle on. <clears throat> so they, were, they went with it. Now let's take a look at what this means. And we're gonna use literally documentation that was changed today from our you know, beloved vendor uh, or one of our beloved vendors, Microsoft. So what happens when we apply Microsoft, or microservices to DDD? Each bounded context now becomes a microservice. Each bounded context now is in theory supposed to own its data and its logic. What happens most often in that context is that we encapsulate all the data access and the logic for that given microservice in a single API service. And that service may optionally support some ancillary task-based services that are close, have a close affinity with the subdomain model that that microservice uh, or that bounded context uh, is, is owning. The interesting thing here is that in the switch to microservices, the guidance largely loses any notion of domain services at all. There are no more domain services in the bounded context like they used to be in OO. All you have is this really big API and maybe some ancillary little task-based things floating around. <clears throat> The other problem with that in mind now, so you've got your bounded context and you've got maybe a singular API and one or more little task-based services floating around, there is no uh, internal anatomy for how that should work within the bounded context at all. So it's the, the internal anatomy of the, of the bounded context is completely arbitrary. And as, as of course, you may guess that becomes very problematic. So what do we mean by that? So this is directly from eShop on containers. This is the book that Microsoft produced. And there's a huge litany of well-known names in the industry in, who have, who have uh, contributed to that book. This is the example architecture they have, shopping, <clears throat> and these are the microservices. Now what's interesting you're gonna see in contrast to the method um, interpretation of this same um, nature of business. In, in the beginning, it looks like the method architecture has more blocks. 
except when you go into the documentation further, you'll see those very blocks start to emerge in images, as we'll see, which I found very fascinating. So we have an identity microservice, a catalog microservice, ordering. And here now we have ordering, if you can see, that has both the ordering API and the ordering background tasks service. We have a basket, and then we have some interesting marketing uh, and location-related things. And if you notice, there's some, there's some uh, BFFs here uh, in the gateway themselves. And, you know, mobile shopping and web shopping are going towards, you know, catalog ordering and basket. And then everyone uses identity uh, as an example. So we'll kind of focus on those two in particular. So we have both a, we have a mobile uh, front end and a web front end for shopping. And then they're all tied together mysteriously in the back by a giant event bus. Okay, uh, and I'm assuming anyone who's gone into an environment that's doing some level of DDD, this all looks very familiar to you in the abstract. Is that true? Anyone? Yes? Raise of hands, shake of head, anything? No one's had to go into an environment that they're using DDD? I find that hard to believe. All right, <clears throat> so maybe you guys don't even need this. Do you want to go through the rest of this or not? I mean, if if you're not if you're not dealing with anyone, uh, so a few people are saying it looks familiar. It's my experience that all I do is deal with Agile shops and some level of DDD. So uh, my experience may be different, though I I doubt it. Uh, just by the sheer uh, statistical base that I I have. All right. Anyway, this is still Microsoft, uh, the latest in Microsoft guidance around architecture. And, and also, it's all mixed with, as you see at the bottom, architecting cloud-native.net applications for Azure. And, and this particular uh, page was updated uh, at the end of uh, October. Now, so we're going to focus on this primarily, like I mentioned. Further in the documentation, they also break out the catalog and they try to explain that you may have one or more services within one of the microservices, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but largely there's a giant web API and then some other ancillary services uh, inside. Now, in comparison, the method encapsulates volatilities in layered service boundaries, recommends a composable design, these service layers then compose to satisfy use cases, not domain, but use cases. We're not building a domain, we're actually building features. What are features? A set of use cases. Runtime activity, not domain. Just hinting at something that is a schism when you use one kind of analysis approach that derives a certain architecture and that is at conflict with what you're actually building. Okay? Just let you absorb that for a moment because that's what's going on. That is the issue at hand. The method goes on, of course. And then we take all those, the, those use cases and we group them together in something we call a logical service. Or, you know, you might have heard a subsystem. And then each logical service becomes a unit of deployment. You know, so it's a logical deployment boundary, not necessarily a physical one. And then, of course, in this um, type of terminology, a logical service is equal to a microservice. Now, what happens with composable design and where does this all start to, to get weird? When you have a composable design of layered volatilities, it introduces the notion of controlled sharing to access and logic. And then that promotes the idea that you want to actually encapsulate the resource access separately from the logic. And that furthermore, it's not just data, it's actually any resource, not just the databases, but any resource, third-party API, file system, et cetera. 
when you choose to encapsulate a use case, or, or the, the method then also uh, promotes encapsulating use cases, uh, the mediation of a use case, meaning you know the sequence, separately. It is straight out, a, ma a manager is a literal expression of the mediator pattern. That's another pattern that resonates with both the DD community and the Agile community. So sometimes when you start to use, the idea is that you can use their language to explain method capability. Of course, as you guys know, the method also promotes a strict governance around internal anatomy of a logical service. It's also a very, very important point that that taxonomy is non-problem specific, which means you're not coming up with a taxonomy for a set of services that only works in the ordering engine or in the ordering microservice. It is the same taxonomy regardless of problem. That's how you engender consistency in the both the structure and the implementation of the code. That is hugely important. It's non-problem specific. I've seen a lot of DDD microservice architectures where for that given problem, it's a valid architecture, but that you can't take, you can't take that architecture in the abstract and have someone else reproduce it in the next project because it's so problem specific. <clears throat> so that's that's kind of the gem that is represented inside the method in terms of that taxonomy. And what do we mean? Of course, it's the client, the manager, the engine, you know, each one of these things being segregated, separation of concerns, single responsibility by volatility now instead of by any other arbitrary metric. This is the basically the equivalent method uh, decomposition by volatility for the e-shopping containers system. And of course, when you look at it, you see directly where the domain uh, design actually lives. And there's some extra there's some extra blocks up here that in the beginning look um, like there's some some schism here between what they have and what we have, and we'll see how that is actually not true. Now, what comes out of this is that it ends up being a critical difference, even if you didn't know the method at all, that DDD drives the decomposition by domain analysis, and that produces an architecture that encapsulates areas of domain model. The method drives decomposition by use case analysis, and that promotes the understanding or actually the surfacing of areas of change. Because if you're focused on the use cases, then all these other things come out that aren't necessarily in the domain model, like workflow. I've never seen a DDD decomp, except what you're about to see, because they're adding it in. And we already went through this with the katas, and I called it out. And there's multiple examples in the industry at large, not just from Microsoft guidance, everywhere. Again, you'll see, you'll see what's shaking out. This, to me, even if you didn't know the method, but you chose to do a DDD decomposition by use case, which sounds weird, in of itself, it would actually get you closer to the method because it would sort it would surface these concerns in the analysis that don't come out when you're only looking at the domain. So it is the critical thing to drive the design process by use case. And of course, this just reiterates what I mentioned. When you're actually doing use case analysis, it starts to identify naturally these areas that change. Like, okay, well, I got this use case, I got this use case. You know, what am I doing with all these things? How do I, how do I start to express them in a common way? Use case analysis also promote uh, surfaces reuse opportunities across use cases and across, you know, different aspects of the system. And what what does that mean? And then of course the need for workflow. 
all of this kind of condensation of of the analysis process helps you to arrive uh, at the sweet spot in cost versus count. That's the essence of the method, right? As you, for those of you who have taken the AMC. What I pr plan to do in 2022 is that if I have the opportunity, I'm going to start, you know, um, presenting these ideas publicly. And in that session, it's actually going to start that all micro if your microservice design does not start with cost versus count, then you've failed before you've even started, which is the Achilles heel of all microservice architectures right now. Way too many services. Right, so this is, and what you'll see even in the industry, they are starting to, um, they, in the context of microservices, in contrast to the, mo the monoliths, they highlight the blue curve that for, um, for a large number of small services, the cost per service is very small. However, no one talks about the cost of integration which will kill you. So you see all these pundits actually promoting that they have a thousand microservices. And I'm looking at it saying like, that's so far over here. And like the asymptotic infinite cost, you can't even, you will never integrate them. It's impossible. The whole thing starts with this one graph. And those of you who have taken my, my architecture clinic know that I actually put this on the board in the beginning and we put it on the wall and we keep it there all week. I have it on my, on my uh, whiteboard. When I design, it keeps me honest. So the process of architecture, like I was, uh, the process of design actually starts with more blocks and then you self-edit. And you go from over here or over here and you arrive in here. Luckily, it's a, it's, it's a zone or region, not a point. So you just need to get close. But this is the essence of what's going wrong with microservices in the industry at large. Now, further in that guidance is this. And I love this because I've never seen this before. And there's conflicting guidance out there about even that you should do this. Yet this is in the microservice or Microsoft guidance. What I'm calling out here is that we have the basket service now calling a catalog and pricing. Go figure. Fascinating stuff in the same document. And then they go on to do this. Now, what looks eerily familiar out of this one? Um, maybe some of the blocks that are in the iDesign method decomp, like pricing and inventory. And ordering is just another word for purchasing. Hmm. This is really starting to look familiar, except they go this far. And you, I'll, I'll send you the link. So this is the things that come out of all this. And then they do this. And at this point, aside from uh, maybe recasting this in terms of volatility instead of domain, I don't know, and it's looking eerily familiar to me. This is literally, you know, not even a month old. And you can find this in all the microservice guidance in any other community, you know, regardless of stack. This is what's happening. Because the alternative doesn't work. The alternative is actually doing these arrows from out here. And the multiplicity of clients will crush you. And they also recognize, so what they did before was there was no aggregator. This is actually named wrong. This is not the aggregator pattern. We're not aggregating anything. It's a mediator. It's just mediating the calls. If you look up you look up the Gang of Four definition of the mediator pattern. It is the method. I mean, it is the manager. Previous guidance had all this happening in the gateway. Then they're like, well, yeah, that's the, actually the security boundary. That's probably not a good place to put any code. That's how they end up with the checkout aggregator. Fascinating stuff. I can't make it up. Now, 
This is literally today. The dapper guidance has taken, you know, they didn't do this. They didn't do this one, wherever it is. They went right to the last one to do their examples, their book. They went right to this one. And then they just recast it. Um, they recast it in dapper terms. Now, that, that red arrow that I got ahead of myself for, of course, is that this is the essence of why we do never do this. You can't go, you can't go bypass the aggregator to get to the catalog. That is the essence of a single uh, point of entry for a set of use cases. Okay. Now, in addition to all that, consider, as I already kind of highlighted, just to wrap this up, that a well-designed access component is, in fact, a domain uh, model service. It encapsulates a part of the subdomain, most likely a non-trivial point, or, not, or additionally a resource. It produces aggregate roots. It promotes data sovereignty. Ye shall never use triggers in a method design or I'll come and, and uh, slap you upside the head. That means there are no triggers between orders. Oh, sorry. And ledger. No. This subdomain for orders is, even though it could be in the same database, there is a boundary here that you honor. And if there's any information between finance and order, it's happening above, and it's a weak reference. This is the truth of data sovereignty. This is exactly what they're saying, but that's not enough, as you've seen. They even they are starting to acknowledge that it's not enough to just have these guys all sending events to each other, and having a like a a horrible massive amount of data duplication. <clears throat> right. Now, let's take a look at this guy, and we'll finish up. So we've got our background tasks and our ordering API. Consider, of course, that in this manager's uh, is the aggregator pattern. I, I, want, I meant to add a bullet here that it's not even the aggregator pattern. It's a mediator, literally. And that the engines are the missing domain services. And that what's happening here is someone acknowledged that they should probably decouple this logic, but what's in here is all still the data access and the logic for ordering. Probably not a good idea, right? You know, so what happens here if I want to if I want to change just like the logic, or if I want to change just one of these background tasks? Now I'm undoing what was thought to be valuable in this microservice by having to deploy it all the time for, for varying reasons. That's no good. And we know from the method, you know, the logic is could be red hot. You did the ordering access and it never changes. So that's the value of opening up this API and segregating it by, by volatility, by, by logic and by access. And then what's in both of these probably gets reshaped into, you know, one or more services. And it's really not about ordering in the first place, but that's a whole different discussion. And I highlight this as just a core capability because this isn't the full method architecture. This is just highlighting the same requisite pieces of the example. Of course, there's a feed subsystem. There's a notification subsystem. Those two in particular are never, those cross-cutting concerns would never come out in the domain language ever. So how would you even know that they're volatile? If you don't segregate out feed, which is like the egress and ingress of data with third parties, where does it end up? It ends up in every single microservice. Same with the notification. If you don't recognize that notification is volatile, then you're sending emails from the client and from every microservice in the back end. Tell me I'm wrong.
if you're not encapsulated, if you don't recognize now circa 2021 that analysis and business intelligence is red hot and highly volatile, you will never have an analysis subsystem that does the renormalization of the information closer to the data before it gets shipped to the, the data warehouse. If you don't do that, where is all the renormalization? It's everywhere. Not good. You get the point. Now, again, I'll just reinforce, use case driven design is the key. Even if you didn't know the method, you would end up surfacing some of this stuff just by driving your decomp by use cases. And then the, because it illuminates the missing pieces and then the taxonomy just comes in and straightens everything out. <clears throat> just like Agile, DDD and the method are not mutually exclusive. In fact, what I came away from all this is that, you know, straight out, most, micro, most DDD architectures are a valid access layer for a mature system. And what we just saw is they're adding the pieces back in to fill in the other layers. So you could just go into that conversation and point them to their beloved vendor's own guidance and say, listen, this is the same thing, except they got the name wrong. It's not, a, it's not an uh, aggregator, it's a mediator. And this manager thing is just a mediator of use cases. And it all starts to come together. And so that's, this is really, that's all, you know, I consider the method actually just an evolution uh, of DDD. It's like the missing pieces that they still, they're slow motion going to, and it's all just there. You know, there's, there's more to it, of course, but in the essence, in this kind of conversation, you don't want to bludgeon them with the whole method. You want to get to the essence of the difference and the value of the commonality and then express the difference and get them on your side. Most of the times, if you, you present it in their language, they may actually just start to pick up on it. All right. And then the final thing is just like with Agile, tact and guile. I suggest we make these APIs a little more coarse grain to reduce the chattiness with the client. Maybe we should uh, introduce a mediator here because to get all this code out of the gateway, and then we can actually reuse it across the BFFs. And then the last one, which is the gem in DDD that I'll leave you with, is that you cannot do D, you, or, or detail design, not DDD, but DD. You cannot do real detail design unless you have polymorphism. <clears throat> Maybe we should use polymorphism in the DTOs to handle all the variability in the data instead of just adding more methods. Sound familiar? All right, guys. I know there's a. I know it's getting late over there. Um, I'm glad to see everyone's partaking. If it were any later, I would be joining you. Um, but it's still a little too early for me. Um, and again, uh, hopefully you found this insightful. I, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, once I got into it, I was really happy to have the, the, the inspiration to actually kind of get all this together um, because, you know, like I said, in the coming year, I'm going to, um, if the opportunity affords itself, which I'm, I'm expecting it to, I'm going to start taking some of this public um, and we'll just get, and, and it's, it's not in a, an accusatory or, an, or a conciliatory way, right? It's like, um, and in fact, a couple of years ago, Eric Evans, you know, there's a huge, you guys uh, may be aware of this. There's, there's a multiple DDD kind of organizations that host this huge DDD conference in Europe. I mean, it's massive. And Eric Evans always does a keynote. And in the 2018 or 2019 keynote, He's actually admitting all this. He's like, yeah, it, it worked pretty well, but you know, it still has some issues. And he actually puts out a call. He's like, if anyone has any ideas on how to make it better, let us know. Um, so I thought that was fascinating. So you can actually go find that keynote. I don't know what year it was. It was either 2018 or 2019. And you can actually go find that keynote and, and hear what he says. And you could probably even use that in a discussion, you know, if there's a really stalwart DDD environment that you find yourself in. Like even 
the man is saying like, yeah, it's not quite working. Uh, and, and we need some refinement. And what we're seeing now in the microservice, uh, Microsoft guidance is just an example of what's in the industry at large of them trying to solve the problems. Because it all just started with chattiness from the client. And then they put it in the gateway. And then, you know, eventually they realize it, it can't be in the gateway. It's got to be somewhere else, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for that. There is a little bonus here because there's an unfinished aspect in that slide deck, in that, um, in that slide or in that diagram that I want to touch on, uh, if you have time. So, do you guys have uh, a couple more minutes just to look at one last piece? Okay. API. What about the API, right? So from my observation of having done this, Sam you know, Newman is the one who actually uh, coined the BFF pattern when he was at ThoughtWorks. And I think it's a fantastic pattern, except I think he got it wrong. The classical BFF pattern says that you should have a BFF for every client platform type. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. What I have found hugely valuable is instead using BFF by client application type. It doesn't matter if it's web, mobile, IVR, or chat. It matters that it's the patient-related set of use cases. That's what the BFF is. It's for the application type, not for the platform type. So that's just one little gem I'll share with you. And yes, the multiplicity of clients, if you don't address it, will come and crush you. Basically, uh, you know, it'll sneak up on you in the dead of night and hit you over the head with a two by four because it's not just the web, it's not just mobile, it's voice, it's chat, it's I don't even know what else, right? Third party API, uh, I can't even, I, there's like at least five or six of them now. So this is, if you apply it, I think I do, I do love the BFF pattern actually because it puts this API or more so this API because the gateway is just a conduit for security and it just, you know, it does a NAT on these calls. This is where the API actually lives. And, and that, um, I think it's a really great idea to have the API be expressed in the vernacular of that given application type you know so the vernacular meaning the language you know maybe some of the the terms are different the behaviors are a little bit different but they all still go back to the same you know microservices on the back end so that's a little gem that i'll i'll leave you with maybe you found the same uh or maybe you haven't got there yet this though you can find in the microservice or microsoft guidance There is a far worse example of this in the guidance, and I couldn't find it again to put it in the deck. There is a slide somewhere in the Microsoft guidance on microservices that shows a matrix of at least 16 or 20 microservices, each done in a different language and each using a different database technology polyglot right that's cool so why not just do every serv every microservice and in, in a different stack just because you can so that you know and then they have this 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 slide with that and with the back end for front end and so it that's why i bring up that you know this is really in direct conflict with cost versus count all right guys that's all i have for you martin uh, doesn't that pattern move the use case orchestration into the API then? I mean, that's what, no, no, what this the is, arrows are showing. Yeah, th this is a use case. I know that that's hard to, I should have a little, um, 
balloon here saying that this isn't a use case. Well, actually, they are use cases, but the sing this is a single singular use case. This isn't orchestrating the use case. You never orchestrate a use case across managers. This is a ch chunky use case on, on consultation manager. And then there is another use case in patient ah, okay. to membership. Yeah, okay, right? good. I, I thought yeah, this no, is the yeah, chain. Exactly. Oh, no. Okay. Right. However, that's what everyone else does. So you saw even in the aggregator, that's just like one. Can you imagine a all the use cases in a mature system, all living in one con one controller in the aggregator API. Everyone's like smirking. You you you're laughing. You should be crying because that's what I find time and again. I find controllers with hundreds of methods, and they're not even self similar. They're not even consistent. That controller, I don't even know what name they give it because it doesn't make any sense. It's got product calls. It's got ordering calls. It's got catalog calls. It's got basket calls all in one controller. What can I do with that? This is why I like Scotch. Now, luckily, you know, I come in from the outside, so I, I get to fix all of it. But, you know, after a while, it just gets boring, to be honest with you. It's all the same thing over and over again. I'm like, come on, guys. Really, do you think this works? And then when you ask, you know, Yuval has one seminal comment or one question. And he posed this to me when I was lamenting into him in my very first endeavor. Like, how do I get, you know, these 100 devs to all get up on the method? And he just shot back an email that said, just ask them how what they're doing now is working for them. How is what you're doing now working? Is what you're doing now working for you? And I did that with the senior tech leadership, and there was crickets. Because they all knew it was not working. They're making a lot of money. And that's actually, uh, that worries me the most when I come into an organization and they're making money hand over fist and they've got an architecture like that. And I sit down with the CEO and I, or the CTO. I'm like, it worries me that you guys are so successful. And they're like, why? I'm like, because what I see in the code base will not support that success. You have a moment of truth coming and you're not going to be happy with it, whether it's scale, whether it's like the slow attrition of being able to push features because every feature takes a little bit longer and then a little bit longer because it's harder and harder. It's all coupled together and you change something here and it breaks over there. <clears throat> and then you get to a point five years in, you don't even feel comfortable putting a feature in because it breaks every time. Sound familiar? That's why I'm, I'm most worried about that. And so that really gets the CTO's attention. And maybe their ire because, you know, but then you don't hire eye design to be yes. We are not yes men. We are not yes men and women. You hire me to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. And, you know, I'm not going to back down. I'm going to be like, yeah, this is the, you know, I hate to tell you this, but it is like this. And you're going to have to fix it. And it's going to be really expensive. So. Do the investment up front. That's maybe the moral of the whole thing, right? That's the essence of the process of design. Invest up front for the dividends long term. And then you, you just save money and make more money over the long term. It's just really hard for the, for the business to, to reason about that you're going to spend a little bit, a bit of time standing in the corner going, is a dog really a dog? Which is the essence of detailed design, believe it or not. It's all about I dog in the end, uh, as simple as that sounds. All right, guys, any other questions? All right, I know it's getting late. It's Friday. It's uh, the holidays are ramping up, whatever holiday that, uh, that you celebrate. Um, I think the whole world is celebrating because at least we've gotten back to some semblance of sanity, some semblance, um, which I think is really important for everyone's well-being. You know, so 
health and wellness to you all. And again, if you have any subsequent questions, just shoot them to, to Kuhn and he'll and, and he'll he'll shoot them to me. You know, I I really enjoyed doing this. Um, so I appreciate you guys taking the time. And uh, I've been starting to get. Uh, I've been doing this quite a bit, actually, these this little spot, you know, organizationally or, uh, or community oriented uh, sessions are pretty cool. Uh, and it gives me the opportunity to get motivated and carve out some time to, to create some new material. All right, everyone, thank you again. I hope uh, you stay safe and enjoy your holidays and uh, hopefully our cross will our, our paths will cross again uh, soon. Take care. <laughs>